truths that we are interested in. We have seen already it is not limited to fiction, but it is a reality today thanks to the amendments brought into the India Act 2008. I hope all of you have seen and at least some of you have read the handout that I had distributed earlier, which clearly tells you the gravity of the whole issue. Now, within this framework, now we have to understand what are the ethical issues. See, please understand as I keep repeating. Ethical issues come into play when there is no law. Now there are some laws. What are the laws? The government has certain power. Very to be more specific, the government has the power to monitor the traffic information, to intercept the communication, and to block the communication. What is the benefit or the rights you enjoy as a common citizen of this country? The benefits you enjoy is if you feel somebody is overreaching their limits, you can seek protection. These two things are there. That is, you have certain rights for privacy. Government has certain powers. When there is a clash between these two ethical issues, Which is more important? Is your privacy more important? Is the security more important? Those kind of questions give us some interesting challenges in ethics. The there are five cases in this chapter, plus one chapter in case. I hope all of you are aware. Those cases, as I keep saying, should provide an entry point for us to discuss other issues. Case number one, 3.1. Come to do everything. Do some work Case number 3.1 is very interesting in fact. Because there is no need to take the textbook out of the <coughs> Because it asks one of the most important questions. What is the right of the employee reserves? What are the rights enjoyed by the employee? When you start working in an organization, what amount of freedom should you have in that case? And what kind of control should the man who is owning that organization should have? The question is this. Imagine a hypothetical situation where all of you are tagged through some technology. In the case it is RFID. You are asked to wear a tag. That tag as our ID, meaning you can be tracked wherever you are. The question is, will you accept to wear such a tag? Is it real infringement of your privacy?
warning its members that is a law enforcement official, the policemen, to wear such tags. Mainly because they undergo some dangerous, really, really dangerous operations. And if they get lost or if they die, if they wear the target, at least somebody can know that they are there. And they are situated there. It can save someone's life. With this Nobel Prize, it seems some state in the US wanted to introduce this idea, but the whole police department rejected this, saying that it is an infringement of their privacy. This question can be broader to say what kind of rights do employees actually enjoy? See, you are being paid to do the job. You go to the place at 9 o'clock, you have to be there till 6. Does that mean that you are completely submitting yourself to the views and fancies of the person here? Or do you feel that there are certain humanitarian grounds on which you should enjoy certain space for it? Don't think this question is completely unrelated to you. I have encountered many companies which not only keep a strict law of when they enter and when they go through that access time, not only that, but they keep a very strict record on how much time you spend in front of the computer. Actively. <coughs> that is the lines of code written, the amount of work done each day is locked somewhere and in your year and appraisal that information is taken. That's a reality. So how much of freedom should they employ in joy? And how much surveillance should be there in the workplace? This is a tricky question. For example, in MSRF itself, we have put up security cameras everywhere. <coughs> Actually, our movements are being recorded, stored, but nobody seems to bother about questioning on who is accessing that, how long will it be stored, who is going to view. This kind of data is not clear. I feel as an educational institute, somebody should have raised this issue, but unfortunately, nobody is raising it. So these kind of issues could have been discussed in this case anyway. The point is this. You have to take a stand here because there is no law. For example, if you take this law itself, the IPI 2000, it does not say about this issue. Should that person keep an eye on its, his employees? Or should the people working there claim to privacy? These issues are not clear here. Therefore, it is an ethical issue. They should have been discussed in a very good term. At least discussed later. The second case is about data aggregators. People who collect the data from different sources, make some sense out of it and then selling it to third parties and establish business practice. Because all the companies, the marketing companies, the credit card companies and people who want to sell their product to someone, they all want this data to see whether somebody in that huge market can be their potential customers. What should be the kind of controls those data aggregator companies should have is discussed in case number one. If you have read it. In fact, the basic question here is this. Can you have some kind of technology to stop people from using what is available today? All this problem arises because of technology, the privacy issues, the security issues and all that. The question is, can we have one more technology to stop people from abusing this technology? Problem has come from technology. Can you solve it through technology is the question. This question has been prominently handled by Deborah Johnson in her. In the very introduction, she very specifically claims that policy vacuums cannot be solved only through policies or technology. If you remember the discussions there. So trying to build one more technology to stop people from abusing technology is at best flimsy. We can't solve the problem at all. For example, let us take yesterday's problem with TCS. Yesterday somebody hacked TCS website. 
The reason, as most of us know, was DNS redirection. Now, can we DNS redirection and MySQL injection kind of common problem be solved through technology? Yes and no. It's very difficult to solve this problem through technology. So the point is very clear. Technology as a means to solve a problem arising in ethics is quite difficult. In fact, that is the same theme discussed in case number three. Case number three in this book is regarding whether a bidding site. There is a specific example given there. In general, the idea is this: if somebody takes steals something from somewhere. The main problem they face is they have to sell it to someone to make money. You do shop with me. Fine. How do you make money? You have to sell it to someone. Right? The point is sites like eBay. When people list stolen goods in eBay, whose responsibility is to check this? Let the classic question pose then. Is it the responsibility of eBay to check people from listing stolen goods, or at least should it have a mechanism in place to stop people from doing this? That was the last day. It will be interesting to discuss with somebody from. <coughs> this question has been asked in various ways by various people. For example, this question was asked by. The agencies in Europe, when they were trying to accuse Pirate Bay of violating copyrights, one of the primary reasons why Pirate Bay came down was because the classic question of whether somebody is stealing the torrents. What does Pirate Bay do? It does nothing. It is a direct listing service. Somebody poses a link, posts a link of a torrent. Of a movie which is copyright, some anonymous maker. Who is responsible now? Should pirate be prosecuted for this offence? This question was asked in courts. The courts ruled that it is pirate based responsibility. You see that because they are, in, after all, at the end of the day, like newspapers. See, in the newspaper, anything can come up. Anybody can write anything. But who is that responsible? Something goes wrong. The editor and the publisher. So, in fact, if you see any newspaper, the last page they will very clearly write responsible for selecting the news according to this ad. Very important question. When when we go when people tell me that they are building social networking websites, when they build when they want to build a discussion forum, this is the main question to be answered. You start a discussion forum. You build a social networking website. People will communicate with each other using your website. You are the one. Something goes wrong. Who is responsible? Ideally, you are. It is your job to filter the data.
discusses the very famous SCO versus IBM fight. This is well known to us in the free and open source world. SCO claiming to be the owners of parts of GNU Linux and then saying whoever uses GNU Linux should pay part of their fees to SCO. This is a very classic fight. I, I hope at least some of you have read the details of this fight. It's a very interesting fight. The question is this. Again, in a community based development like free and open source software, all of us contribute something to do the big thing. Who should be the owners of that big thing? You build part by part, everybody contributes part by part. Now there is a big actual working software. Who should own it? That is an ethical question. Mainly because copyright laws, patent laws are very clear on who should be the owner. If you create it. Now you have not created the entire software, you have contributed to the entire creation. This is an ethical question. That could have been discussed. Case number 5 in this chapter is regarding the practice of IT auditing. The case is very interesting. That's a case of some financial company which was situated in the World Trade Tower. After 9-11 happened, since everything came down, the company was at loss. All its IT resources went down. The company has now restarted its operations, but it does not want one more shutdown. So what it does is it has created a practice. They have given it some name, I am not bothered to name. The practice is this. The IT managers of the company at all timing will call all their employees. They will set a panic call. All employees should come to the office and imagine that everything has gone down and recreate the entire IT system. The question posed to us is this, if a company start doing this kind of operation every now and then, how effective will the employees be in actual situation? When I was reading this, I told the answer to this problem is very simple. Amal bara hindi ne thoda bato thoda karte hai, jana chhiti ro hai kordi hai, thoda bato thoda. Aato bato kya hai, kya answer bolte rata hai? Very simple answer to the problem. Thoda bato thoda bato thoda bato karte hai, jana chhiti ro hai kordi hai. There is a story, now there is a fox coming, so the entire village is to come. There is a person who is like... Why should I take it? Share and share. For example, I was in discussion with many companies for some solution in this regard. 
For example, let us have a completely different network of students. They can be private network. And a separate network for staff. Separate network for administrative people. Let this be three separate networks. That kind of idea was thought of even in MSRI, but somehow they didn't work. The question is this. How much of restriction is okay in an academic institute? How much freedom should be given? How to do the basic balancing of freedom and control with respect to access to technology in education institutes? This is a question posed. This could have been a good question to debate, but anyway. So, my earnest appeal to all of you is that you please tell me before because now I have taken it for granted that case study thing is over, that no more cases will be taken because there is no use. I will return to normal actually. At least, if you try to take a stand on either of these cases, you will understand the topics better and the classroom itself can be more interesting rather than a sleepy kind of environment being prevalent here like this in the class. In the textbook, the author, I think, was very much confused when they were writing this chapter. Because on the one hand, they had to rise and discuss the ethical issues. On the other hand, they had to deal with the technical topics. See, for example, how does privacy intrusion happen? What are the threats? Logic bombs, words, project process, denial of service. All these technical things are there. How to stop them? There are technology available using firewalls, using virtual private networks, encryption, decryption. All these technical discussions are there on the one hand. And on the other hand, there are ethical and moral issues emerging out of this situation. I think the authors were somewhat very much confused on what to deal and what not to do. So they have mixed up everything. You, while you are reading, you must be very clear that our focus is more on ethical issues and not on technical issues per se. Those technical issues we discuss in your network classes, in your communication classes and in your cryptography classes. I am not very much bothered about technology. My basic focus was on these things are there within the context of law, how do we take care of them. So I leave it to you to explore the rest of the ideas. In my next lecture, I will, as I have already told, I will go to chapter number 10 how to build and manage information systems. That will be my theme for next lecture.